I would like to introduce our next distinguished guest, a Mr. Alan Gibbons, who is a local community independent councillor, LCI group leader on Liverpool City Council and Transform EC member. Mr. Gibbons. Okay. Right, good morning ladies and gentlemen, salam alaikum, shalom alaikum and peace be upon you. Uh, our group is three councillors in Liverpool and we predate the crisis in Gaza, but we give absolute solidarity to the people of Gaza. All of our leaflets are published in colours that should be very familiar to you and are encapsulated on that flag. Our split from Labourism started last May when we stood against the Labour Party in eight seats. We rebelled initially over the attempt to cut £11.7 million from the adult social care budget and to impose a green bin charge which unfairly discriminated against poor residents in our city who had large gardens which date back to when people like an Iron Bevan and Clement Attlee actually built council houses, something shamefully neither Labour or Tory have ever done on any scale since. Now, that division that we had, the first time that we had to take a political act, our first political act as new councillors, socialist councillors, who had broken with austerity, was to go and stand on a picket line outside Eurovision, which was happening in Liverpool, in solidarity with the Palestinian people and calling for a boycott. The second activity was a week later, well, three days later, when we spoke at a second picket of Eurovision. Prior to that, we had got in trouble with the Labour Party because they attempted to set up an arms fair which meant that about 20 companies in which the United Kingdom investment was implicated, this was going to happen in our city, which meant we would be complicit with the bombing of Yemen and investment in arms that could be used against Palestine. So we campaigned against it. Three of us, who were then Labour councillors, were told that we had to keep our mouths shut because we had tried to requisition an, um, an alternative e emergency general meeting of the City Council to stop the arms fair. We were treated in terms of repression by an authoritarian re Labour regime. These were the seeds that led to the positions that we hold now. Now I think everybody in this room knows that this crisis, there is something different. It echoes the march is against Iraq. But in Liverpool, I have never seen the scale of mobilisation as we have at the moment. I think now we've had 22 weekly marches through the city of Liverpool, numbering hundreds. As long as these genocidal troops destroy people's lives, armed by the United States, justified by the United Kingdom, we will march every week. We occupied the train station, we have held other vigils. As long as the Palestinian people are going through this agony, we will stand by them. The next thing I've got to say is, I am not in a councillor like some of, co of the colleagues here. I am not in a council seat like you see in Blackburn or some areas of Preston. I know of only four or five British Muslims in my ward. My ward is 98.4% white. And even in a seat like that, probably the whitest seat in the country, everybody is Anglo-Irish basically. I think our biggest minority community is Roma. Even in a seat like that, when I get on the train with my kafia to go into town on a Sunday, I've got lots of people travelling in the same direction from my ward. I have people who come up and say, we back you to the hilt. I've not had a single resident say that I am on the wrong side over Palestine. Now this is vital. And how do you maintain that? This, I think, has got to be part of the thread of this conference. 
We make sure that we are on every picket line that we can, standing up for working people. Our politics can't be trapped into the council chamber. Anybody who's gone through select committees and council chambers know it's a deadening and frustrating experience. We have 61 Labour councillors to contend with. When we try to put through a motion on what we suspect of as corruption related to a company called Beautiful Ideas, to their shame, every single one of the Labour councillors voted down an independent inquiry. And that included people who dared to call themselves Corbynites in the early days, people I had shared platforms with. We make sure that every time there is a campaign to defend working people, we stand with them. So there's a petrochemical plant in the constituency of our parliamentary candidate, Sam Gorst, called Veolia, which processes the same chemicals that exploded at Flixborough in 1974 and killed 28 people. We are involved in the campaign. The Labour Party voted to process the application and make it possible for that plant to expand. This is a disgrace. In other words, wherever working people's lives are affected, whether it is potholes, whether it is poor pay, whether it is bad housing. I've got residents in my ward who have had water running down the walls, mushrooms growing. We all know about the little lad in Rochdale who died because of mould. And they're being asked to pay £900 they are subjected to Section 21 conviction, uh, evictions. We have to stand with people who face those conditions. We have to tell them, as Sam says on this leaflet, the money spent killing children in Gaza should be spent on our local community instead. In that way... In that way, the politics and the conditions of ordinary working class people's lives and the struggle for decency and solidarity internationally can stand together like two hands. That is what we've got to fight for. Because, to be honest, we have very modest claims, as the great Irish socialist James Conley said. We have a very simple demand. We want the world. Now, this conference has got to be the start of that. And the last thing I'll say is, it's got to be principles. In principle, we want to see the liberation of Palestine. Sometimes you do have to make concessions. I'll give you an example. We are massively outnumbered by the Labour Party, and we are outnumbered 14 to 3 by the Lib Dems on Liverpool City Council. Three Greens, three Liberals. We wanted to get a ceasefire motion through on the council. How do you do that when they were so reluctant? We had to make a concession that in the motion, we couldn't argue with the idea of a two-state solution. I'll tell you bluntly, since 1967, I have wanted a one-state, secular state for Palestinian, Bedouin and Jew alike. But at least, we were able to drag some of the old establishment red and blue and yellow Tories screaming into an act of solidarity with the Palestinian people. That matters. You don't make sacrifices on principle. You do find ways to make the cogs of society turn. We have recently written to all of the other political groups on Liverpool City Council to say that we should disinvest from the arms industry, because of Palestine, because of Yemen. Only one group has replied to me to say no because they thought you need arms to fight Putin's Russia. Even the Greens have not yet replied and I've written to them four times. Solidarity actually means taking a stand, not when it's popular, but when it's unpopular. It means you've got to show some guts. So, we want unity in this conference. I think there's a number of principles. One has got to be Palestine. One has got to be opposition to cuts and to austerity. And I think one has got to be absolute solidarity 
with all our communities in the United Kingdom, with the migrant community, with the settled communities. And I tell you what, if anybody ever tries to smear migrant communities or to talk about stopping small boats, I am not with you. I am not with you. My family came from Ireland in the wake of Anne Hortemore, the great starvation of the Irish people, which was a political act of the British ruling class. It wasn't a spontaneous failure of a crop. And I believe that if capital can move anywhere in the world, Labour has the right to move anywhere in the world as well. And anybody who tries to whip up anti-migrant feeling is not my brother, not my sister. So basically, we've got a growing movement and we should thank the people who set up the various um, activities. We had a great conference in London. I'm sure we're going to have a great conference today. We've got emerging groups of significant numbers all over the country. And it is not going to be easy to win. It's not going to be easy to win. There's still the legacy, places like Liverpool, where people think that the Labour Party is the party that gave them social reforms under Wilson. He did lots of horrible things as well, I should say. They think it's something to do with the party that established the welfare state, mass council housing, public ownership and the NHS under Attlee and Bevan. I'll tell you what, they're not. Take one look at West Street in good luck to Leanne Mohammed at getting rid of this slimy backstabber. And the way we're going to win is by firm principle on international solidarity, opposition to cuts, opposition to austerity, standing with working class people wherever they fight, because in the end of the day, we don't just want, ultimately I think we do need a new political party, we'd grope our way towards it, it might emerge, a bit like the Labour Party did, a bit like the Communist Party did, from various constituent parts, who knows? We don't need people telling us my way or the highway, it's got to emerge from below and has got to look at each other with respect and develop something new. But most of all, it's got to be a movement of working people from below. We don't want opportunities from above. We don't want anybody taking a ride off our backs in our communities, of our communities, to transform the world. Let's do it. Wow, thank you very much. Our next distinguished guest, uh, Mr. Michael Lavalette, is an Emeritus Professor in Social Policy at Liverpool Hope University. A former Respect Councillor for 11 years, he regularly visits and leads student field trips to the West Bank. He's the author of over 30 books, including two on Palestine. One is Voices from the West Bank 2010, and the, net, the other is Palestinian Cultures of Resistance 2021. Please welcome Mr. Lavalette. Brothers and sisters, uh, comrades and friends, um, assalamu alaikum. Um, I want to start off by thinking about where we are in the movement around Gaza. For eight, for six months, uh, we have watched unfold in our television screens a genocide. There is absolutely nobody who can tell us that they have not been aware of the horror that has been inflicted on the people of Gaza. There is not a single person who can tell us that they are not aware that 15,000 children have been murdered. There is nobody who is not aware of the fact that mosques, churches, hospitals, schools and housing districts have been bombed to smithereens. And as that horror has unfolded, our political parties, the main political parties in this country, have said absolutely nothing. They've said nothing 
And yet, if you look at the opinion polls, consistently, round about 68% of the population of this country have been in favour of an immediate ceasefire. We are not the minority. We are part of the huge majority in favour of ceasefire. If you look at the most recent opinion polls, 58% of the population of Britain are for a ban on arms sales to Israel. We are not the minority. We are part of the majority on this issue. And yet the three main political parties continue to stand with Israel, despite the horror it's inflicting in Gaza, and despite the fact that it is trying to provoke a wider war in the Middle East, with Iran, with Lebanon, and Syria, and Yemen. They are putting our world in the most precarious position. And if you listen to Joe Biden yesterday, if that war happens, America quite clearly will stand with Israel, and Israel is bringing our world to our most dangerous precipice. And yet our parties say absolutely nothing. It has been up to people like you and me to take the question of Palestine onto the streets and into the political mainstream. If you think about it, back on the 7th of November, they tried to say that we were all anti-Semitic extremists. They tried to stop every single one of our marches. And on the 12 occasions on which we have gone to London, they have tried to criminalise us, marginalise us, and tell us that we should not be on the streets. Remember Suella Braverman. She said that we should not march, that it was a point of principle for her. She would not let us march on the 11th of November. We marched. We are still here. She's gone. The movement for Palestine has been remarkable in terms of its scale and its breadth. Week after week, there are demonstrations in towns and cities across this country, and those national demonstrations in London have been of an immense size that we have not seen since 2003 and the run-up to the war in Iraq. And in November, when there was a ceasefire motion that went through the House of Commons, the main parties whipped their members to vote against that. And from that point, our movement said very clearly, no ceasefire, no vote. Those, those people who have refused and who refused to vote for a ceasefire could not take for granted our votes at the general election when it came. So no ceasefire, no vote, and a promise from each and every one of us that Palestine would be on the ballot paper come the general election. And now what we are seeing up and down this country is groups of people coming together to form independence to challenge the main political parties. Now we want to say something about independence. Because when I was growing up, if somebody stood as an independent, it usually meant that they were a Tory in disguise. But that's not what we mean by independence today. Those independents are independent of the main political parties and independent of the political establishment and independent of their continuing support for the horrors of genocide and the state of Israel. But we're not independent. We are part and parcel of this movement. We have been from this movement, we've been on the streets with this movement, we continue to be part of this movement, and we're accountable to this movement. This is part of us forming our new organisations, taking the arguments forward to think about how we can progress in the future. So we're independent of the main political parties, but we are dependent and built and part of the movement for social change and the movement around Palestine. So our argument was that after November, no ceasefire, no vote, and Palestine will be on the ballot paper. But our campaigns must be Palestine plus. General elections are not fought on single issues. So Palestine plus means, of course, Palestine's on the ballot paper, but we have to relate to all the other issues that affect our communities. And if you think about that, for the last 15 years, we've had Labour government, Labour uh, Tory Lib Dem coalition and Tory government, and each one of them has implemented austerity cuts, cuts to welfare, cuts to our communities, 
And yet they tell us there's no money for us to address those things. But if you think for a minute, every time they want to launch a war, there's always money for the bombs, there's always money for the aircraft, there's always money to give to Israel or whatever it is. They have money for war. Well, we don't want money for war. We want money for welfare and we want money for ordinary people's needs in this country. So Palestine plus means yes, Palestine's on the ballot paper, but so is our National Health Service. So are housing conditions. So is the crisis of austerity and the cost of living crisis that ordinary people face on a day-to-day -day basis. And our candidates must reflect all of that as we go forward with the challenge. And no doubt, at some point, some Tory or Labour politician will say, but where's the money coming from, Michael, for all these things? So of course, no war put the money to welfare, that's one argument. But let's think about another way that we can raise the money. You see, just 15 years ago, or, or, or in 2008, when there was a banking crisis, we have been in austerity. So every single person in this room, in real terms, is worse off today than we were in 2008. In terms of our wages and declining wages, in terms of the standard of our living, in terms of the services and the funding of services, each and every one of us is worse off. But there's a group in this country who are not worse off. In 2009, the wealth of the 1,000 richest people in this country amounted to £250 billion. Think about that, a thousand people, 250 billion pounds in, in 2009. Today, that 1,000 people's wealth is over 750 billion pounds. So their income, their wealth has increased threefold to 750 billion pounds. Now, some of you in here will be from the Muslim community and in the Muslim community, every day, every year pays zakat. Zakat is 7.5% of your wealth. So, if we were just to take a Zakat payment off those 1,000 people, that would give us £160 billion more than we spend on the National Health Service. We are a phenomenally rich country. There are phenomenally wealthy people in this country. Their wealth has increased over the last 10, 15 years, while our wealth and our share has gone down. And we must stand proudly, squarely, behind a campaign that says, yes, Palestine is on the uh, ballot paper. We are for the liberation of Palestine, we're for the refusal to arm Israel. Yes, we are for an end to the cost of living crisis, for funding our National Health Service, for funding our education system. Yes, we're for the end of student debts and for the repayment of those debts to students so that they are not starting off working life with fifty-six, sixty thousand pounds worth of debt hanging over their necks. Yes, we are for decent pensions. We are living in a country where we have some of the worst pensions in Western Europe, despite the fact we pay in all our life. And if you want to know where we get the money from, we take it from the phenomenally wealthy in this country who have benefited from 40 years of neoliberalism, of 40 years of Labour and Tory parties who have been prepared to let the rich get richer while we've all suffered. The time for change is now. Thank you very much, Mr. Lavalet. Absolutely amazing and such heartfelt emotion. Thank you for that. Uh, our next esteemed guest uh, is Mr. Craig Murray, who's a parliamentary candidate and has also been a former ambassador. Mr. Craig Murray. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's um Wonderful to be back here in Blackburn, and I am deeply honoured to have been asked to stand for Parliament again here in Blackburn and Darwin, uh, to have been asked by Blackburn's independent candidates, councillors, to be asked by the Workers' Party of Great Britain, and we are going to give it one hell of a honour at getting elected here in Blackburn. I stood for election here in 2005 against Jack Straw, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that at the end of this speech. 
Uh, and at the start, I'd also like to say that we've heard three magnificent speeches, and I've, it very seldom happens uh, that I sat there and I think I agreed with every single word every one of the speakers said. I thought they were absolutely fantastic. Forgive me. I won't actually repeat all those points, although they were very good. Um, I want to talk about a couple of things in my personal experience that no one else can talk about because it's my experience, um, and give you a few thoughts. I was there in the International Court of Justice in The Hague for the genocide case between South Africa and Israel. I was present in the courtroom. There were only 14 seats in the public gallery. I had to start queuing at 2 o'clock in the morning in minus 7 degrees centigrade in The Hague in February in order to get one of those 14 seats. At 4.30 a.m., still in minus 7 degrees centigrade, I was joined in a queue by my friend Jeremy Corbyn, who also queued in the early hours of the morning in the freezing cold. And Jeremy is even older than I am. Uh, so that was uh, a feat, a real feat. And we sat there and we listened to the South Africans on the first day outline the most compelling case. Now it's true, there is nobody in the entire world who does not know that genocide is happening in Gaza. It is as plain as your face. Everybody has seen the evidence. There are people who for political reasons, seek to deny it. But that doesn't mean they don't know it's happening. Everybody knows it's happening. And the South African lawyers, or the lawyers on behalf of South Africa, outlined in detail after detail the facts of the genocide. Over 750,000 homes destroyed. Over 10,000 children killed. More by now the maimings, the deaths in pregnancy, the killings of doctors, of aid workers, of lawyers, of university professors, the incredible percentage of children killed in the conflict. Approximately 40% of all the people killed by Israel have been children. That's just not normal in war. War, of course, is not normal, but that's not normal in war. In almost every genuine war, genuine armed conflict, the death rate of children killed is between 8 and 10 percent. I, I, I cannot find any example of any conflict in recent history where 40 percent of those killed has been children. That is the plainest indication this is not a war this is a genocide, a killing of a people. We listened to this, outlined brilliantly by the South African lawyers, and on the second day, we listened to the Israeli lawyers. And it was astonishing to be there. They lied, and they lied, and they lied. Let me tell you some of the things they said. They said the reason that so many children were killed was that Hamas employs child soldiers. They said that the reason that so many homes were destroyed were these were booby-trapped by Hamas or were misfires of Hamas rockets. They said that more aid trucks were now entering Gaza than the volume that used to enter before October the 7th. And they said that every single hospital in Gaza was a Hamas military base. And those lawyers stood there and said those things. And it occurred to me, everybody in that room, including the people saying those things, knew those things were not true. Everybody knew those are lies, including the lawyers making the lies, including the agents of the Israeli government sitting behind them. And they were telling lie after lie after lie, and the judges knew they were lies. The judges definitely knew they were lies. And they were telling the lies 
to justify the killing of children, to enable the killing of children to continue. And I sat there and I thought, I am in the presence of evil. That was the presence of evil. How anybody can do that, can try to continue a genocide, try to continue the killing of children, and try to justify it by standing before the highest court in the world and telling lie after lie. And that is why we are in a situation where there is no two-state solution. Israel is not a genuine political entity. Israel is a terrorist entity spreading evil in the world. On the 16th of October, um, I was flying back from a WikiLeaks meeting in Reykjavik. Um, and I was detained at Glasgow Airport under the counter-terrorism law. I was detained under the Terror Act. I was told by the police that I was not entitled to a lawyer under the Terror Act, but I, had, I was not entitled to remain silent. I had to answer all questions. I had to give them my laptop and my mobile phone, and I had to give them uh, all the passwords for my devices, and that failure to do that was in itself an offence under the Terror Act carrying two years imprisonment. I have never had any connection with violence in my entire life or any connection with terrorism. I'm a former <coughs> British ambassador and the former rector of a university. And here I was being questioned under the Terrorism Act. And I was asked why I supported Palestine. I was asked why I had attended a demonstration on pa Palestine in Iceland. And I was asked, actually they asked me what was said on the demonstration for Palestine in Iceland, and I replied, I have no idea, I don't speak Icelandic. But they, um, I was asked if I would ever attend more demonstrations on Palestine, and I said, I most certainly will. <laughs> they kept my devices. They told me I was under investigation under the Terrorism Act, and apparently I still am under investigation under the Terrorism Act, and the reason I'm under investigation under the Terrorism Act is that I have said, as a former senior diplomat, as a former ambassador, I am telling you it is a simple truth in international law that an occupied people had the right of armed resistance. Now, I stood here for election against Jack Straw in 2005. And I stood because I had recently resigned from the Foreign Office. He used to be my boss. And I would resigned over the issue of torture and extraordinary rendition, where Muslims were being sent. <laughs> Muslims were being sent all around the world, including to Uzbekistan, where I was ambassador, in order for them to be tortured on behalf of the CIA and with MI6 involvement. And I knew that Jack Straw knew because I had told him personally. I had reported this back to him. And I was told at that time that it was not illegal for Britain to get intelligence from torture. And I also knew, because I knew of many of the cases, that the majority, the large majority of the Muslims who were being taken around the world and tortured were entirely innocent and were being tortured to get false confessions. I also knew, because I used to be the head of the Foreign Office section of the Embargo Surveillance Center, uh, which uh, my job was 24 hours a day to look at Iraqi weapons procurement. I also knew for a fact that there were no Iraqi weapons of mass destruction, and I knew for a fact that Jack Straw and Tony Blair knew that. 
and that the Iraq war was based entirely on lies. And that's why I stood here in Blackburn to tell the people of Blackburn that and to challenge him. And I did that. I came here and we had a three-month campaign in which I did that. And in, since Gaza happened and since I've declared I'm standing here in Blackburn again, I have had dozens of people, dozens of people come up to me and tell me how guilty they feel that they didn't vote for me, but they voted for Jack Straw. And what I say to them is this, do not feel guilty. Jack Straw was known in this community and this community had memories of the time when the Labour Party did stand for working people. And at that time, he said I was lying about torture and extraordinary rendition. And in early 2005, it hadn't yet been proven. I understand that people believed him and did not believe me. But there is nobody in the whole world now who does not know I was telling the truth about torture and extraordinary rendition. and that Jack Straw was a supporter of the torture of Muslims and a bare-faced liar. And I say to you this, please nobody feel guilty for not voting for me last time, but you'd better vote for me this time because now you know, now you know about Gaza, now you know but the Labour Party has not only opposed a ceasefire, the Labour Party still, to this day, is supporting British arms exports to Israel. All arms exports to Israel must be stopped. We are at a turning point. Yesterday, Keir Starmer announced that the Labour Party will increase defence spending to 2.5% of GDP. That's a 25% increase in defence spending. Yet they tell us there's no money for an incoming Labour government to improve hospitals or schools. They tell us we need more privatisation in the health service. They tell us that austerity, Tory austerity, has to continue. The Labour Party has abandoned the people. It is time for the people to abandon the Labour Party. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our next guest is uh, Councillor Suleiman Kona, JP, who has been a Lancashire Magistrate for over 22 years, Councillor for over 20 years, a local man and community leader champion. His volunteering skills is beyond anyone. A man who supports all the news agents in the country, and he was the national president covering the whole of the UK not long ago. A man who needs no introduction, please welcome Mr. Suleiman Kona. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon, or probably still morning, I think. It is three minutes. I always get that time in between the lunch or the lunch, you know, straight after. And how funny, food comes in and I'm here. It's always the case. Look. We've heard a lot this morning, ladies and gentlemen, about what's been happening, where we need to go. But I'm not going to bother touching on that, but I don't need to preach anybody about what's been happening over the last 10 years, much more than that. But what I want to touch on is what you need to be doing when you are at the doorstep. The message that you need to be doing. Don't forget that Gaza is still hungry, is still thirsty, is hurting more and more. It's bleeding more and more. 
How long can they carry on? That is the first thing you need to be saying. You must not stop talking about Gaza when you are at the doorstep. That is so, so important because that's one of the things why I left Labour Party and I have no regrets whatsoever. Thank you. You must also remember and be absolutely clear and tell the, all the senior parties that you sold Gaza and we sold you in the ballot paper. It's absolutely time. People have had enough. It's enough. We need to ditch all the Tories, the Labour, the Lib Dems, all those parties. It's time to say goodbye to you all. And you know what? People will be saying, what is the alternate? What is the alternate? The alternate is what you've been hearing this morning. And there'll be much more you'll be hearing this afternoon. Independent is the way forward. That is the key wherever you go. And let's not forget, and this is a message clear to all the residents, being an independent, whether a councillor, whether an MP, whatever, being independent, it gives you that several benefits, so much unique that no other party would have. You will be speaking to the authorities, to whoever, on behalf of the electors, on behalf of the constituents who elected you. So you know about what they are, you know what they need, and that is why you are there to represent them. So don't forget, it is that belief, it is what you do that is so important to move forward. Absolutely clear. This way, you will not be bound by any party. You'll not be gagged. You'll not be told not to go to demos. You'll not be told not to go to marches. You are there because you're representing the people of your ward, of your constituents. Can I also remind you, the other message that you need to be telling everyone is absolutely clear. All those people who go to the demos, all those people who go to the marches, they are not anti-Semitic. They are there for the justice of the Palestinian people. Do you know what? All along, wherever you were reading, writing, looking at the telly, whatever, all the main parties so far have used the diplomatic way to cover Israel on the war crimes. Your message must be clear. Enough is enough. Absolutely. Dead on. No more. But you know what? Whilst you're saying no more Labour, no more, independ no more Tories, no more Lib Dems, you need to stand up with each other. It's so important that we all support each other. Whether you're travelling from London to Blackburn, whether you're travelling from Scotland to Blackburn, whether you're travelling from Blackburn to South, wherever, we must support each other. So important. This is the time where we need to be supporting each other. There'll never be another time to support each other other than this one. I say to several candidates in Blackburn that if you don't get elected this time, you need to stand up and think for yourself why you didn't get elected. People on the doorstep, they're ready to vote for you. Independents, of course they are. They're ready to vote for you. They just want you to knock that door. So you must knock each and every door, wherever you are in the country. Every door must be knocked. Knock the door. Tell people they are with you. The moment you knock the door, you say you're independent, they'll tell you straight away they are with you. So the message is clear, whether it's Rishi, Kia, Angela, whoever you are out there, that look, enough is enough. And I start where I begin, I say that they sold Gaza, they sold you, they told you lies after lies after lies, covering up left, right and centre. And guess what? We're going to do it. We're going to do it on the ballot paper. That is the way to fight back. And its only way is independent and to fight back. Ladies and gentlemen, my point really is to get the message across. Support each other at each and every doorstep. Because simply, the poster tells you all, no ceasefire, no vote. I say that because how many of them say to you, no ceasefire, no vote? 
if they did, ask them how they did it, when they did it, and how they did it. They damn didn't. If they did, they were just covering up of lies after lies. So no vote for anybody who did not do ceasefire. But your message must be clear. Support each other wherever you are. Travel if you have to. Because if they don't get elected, don't be regretting it tomorrow. Blame yourself. The residents, the constituents, they're absolutely waiting for you. Knock each and every door. Don't be regretting tomorrow when you lose by 20 votes, 30 votes. No, you don't. Each and every one, use your social media. Use whatever means you need to do to get to the constituent. That's the important bit. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, it's time to ditch the lot of them. And this is the time. There'll be no better time for you, for me, for all of us, to ditch the lot. Thank you.